Good evening, everyone. All right, so, well, first of all, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to, to present, to share with you. Um, I will, I'll give you a couple of disclaimers, okay? And I'll put them on the table from the beginning so that we're all on the same basis, right? The first thing is this. I by no means call myself an expert, uh, but it's a situation where when you're passionate about something, you're, you're excited to share with others what you've learned, right? And at the end of the day, if it's something that can be of benefit to the people that we share it with, why not go ahead and do it, all right? That's the first thing. Uh, I have a couple of disclaimers, right? Um, one of them is this, and, and we're talking about eating a plant-based diet. I myself am uh, not just a, a, an advocate, but I'm a user. So I do, I do, I do practice a plant-based diet or plant-based eating. I probably eat fish probably once a week um, at maximum. Sometimes I go without it completely. Uh, sometimes the convenience of travel allows you to eat a little bit of it. I've cut out meat out of my diet probably about three years ago. And the other thing I want to tell you too is, uh, this is my wife's place, is Little Mustard Seed Healthy Cafe. And they do, we do present people with plant-based alternatives and everything of that sort, all right? The other thing I'll tell you too, I'm an Adventist. And I'll put that on the table too because I'm, I'm gonna quote some studies that do involve Adventists. It's just so happened that because of certain practices that we do, the, the scientists decided that they wanted to study that population too, okay? So putting all these things on the table, I'm hoping that the information I pass on to you is it's, you're going to um, take and understand the facts from it. It is documented, it's documented literature rather, and, and the information will, is going to be very useful to you. So, eating a plant-based diet for optimal health. So let me, let me start by telling you what the problem is, okay? And this is the problem, chronic diseases. I mean, we've moved from the time when people used to be killed by the measles and the plague and the polio and all of these things, right? And, you know, modern medicine has, in, has, has brought forward a lot of things that have been very useful, things like antibiotics, things like... Um, um, aspirin, thrombolytics, and the rest of those things and stuff, which have helped to rescue people from many things, right? However, moving away from, from those communicable illnesses that wiped people out, right? We move to now chronic illnesses, and right now, no matter what it is that we come up with, we still have thousands and millions of people who are dying from chronic non-communicable diseases. So I refer you to a, a, a publishing from the World Health Organization in 2004, where they said preventing chronic diseases is a vital investment. All right, so this man here now, he is, the, he is um, I think his name was um, Lee Jong-wook. He says that the lives of far too many people in the world are being blighted or cut short by chronic diseases such as heart disease, stroke, cancer, chronic respiratory diseases, and diabetes. So we know what chronic illnesses are, right? And I'm sure we're familiar with these things because either ourselves or our families have suffered with one of these things, right? This is the president of Nigeria now, and he, he made something, he made a very profound statement, you know, and I'll tell you a little bit about it later. So he says here, he says, prosperity is bringing to our nation many benefits, but they are changes that are not positive. As our diets and habits are changing, so are our waistlines. And he went on to talk about, you know, more than 35% of women in Nigeria being overweight. And by 2010, that number would have risen to about 45%. Now, does anybody know the number of people who are overweight and obese in the Bahamas from the latest study? I think it was a step study in 2012. Huh? It's 78.9%. Meaning 8 out of 10 people are either overweight or obese. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. So that's a problem. Now, this chart shows as we move up the income bracket, because the Bahamas is, is, is in the upper middle income countries, right? 
There to say we up there too, right? So as we move up from the low-income countries where communicable diseases took the, the, the major blunt of, of what was killing people, we move into lower middle, upper middle income countries and what becomes more prominent? Chronic diseases, heart disease, stroke, and the rest of those, right? As we go up the income bracket, communicable diseases disappear and non-communicable diseases become much more prominent. So this is the Bahamas, 1994 to 2011, and look at what's going up, heart disease, right? Look at what's going up, cancers, all right? And it's so messed up because, I mean, you know, we talk about the crime rate and we talk about the shootings and everything, but heart disease is killing almost six to seven times more people than the, 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 the guns and the work accidents and the traffic accidents and all of those combined. So it is very concerning. So diabetes, strokes, hypertension, and all the different rel related illnesses. So... This compares with the U.S. data, 10 leading causes of death, and what we see is the same thing. Heart disease, cancer, strokes, respiratory illnesses, diabetes, those are the things that take the highlight. And it shows that even African American, as in the, 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 the black population or the white population, it is the same thing, or it is it's very similar. So... We start by just talking about obesity, right? And obesity, basically, it's, a, it's an input versus output situation. You know, we're moving away from, from the walking to where we go, and we move away from the farm work. So now we drive to everywhere we go. We sit in an office. Most of our days are spent sitting, all right? So we have now, but the problem is that, on, on the converse, we're still eating more. More and more and more that what, than what our, our grandparents used to eat in their days. So we have this increased input and this decreased output. So therefore, it leads to obesity, right? Now, I, I'm actually going to tell you something, though, because one of the biggest researches that they found out about a plant-based diet is that calorie counting doesn't have to be as restricted. And I will tell people that for even the people who are doing Weight Watchers, where you find yourself strictly counting calories, when you eat a plant-based diet, you will find that you do not have to be as strict with your calorie counting. Because your body will take what it needs, and the rest of it will get excreted out. So that's the first thing, all right? I wanted to just throw that point right in there. So, obesity. Now this is, this. we're going to do some big physiology there now and show you a little bit of thing there, right? So we eat too much and also to eat too much of the wrong things that I'm going to detail in a little bit. What we end up is with, the, is with that visceral obesity, that, that belly fat, right? That's obesity in the trunk. Now that leads to insulin resistance. I'm not going to go in very much detail, but the issue is this. Leads to insulin resistance, your body now has to put out a whole lot more insulin just to achieve the same amount of work, all right, to decrease your blood sugar. So what that means, it leads to this big word called hyperinsulinemia, which is plenty of insulin in the blood. Do you know that just that is directly responsible and directly a, a, a very great risk factor for hypertension, high cholesterol, plaques in your blood vessels, and type 2 diabetes? Now, genetics do play a certain role. I mean, even in the Bahamas, we do have an issue with genetics and things like breast cancer and a number of other things, yes. But the issue is this. Even genetics may, may load the gun, but at the end of the day, is the lifestyle changes are the things that pull the trigger. All right? Take that home, too. So, so here's the situation. So we're talking about Cancers, all right, and, and this is U.S. data. Lung cancer is one of the biggest killers in the U.S. It's like number one. And what they found is that, hey, uh, smoking contributes about 90% to lung cancer. What that means is that if you were to knock off smoking, you're going to cut your risk for lung cancer by 90%. That's amazing, isn't it? All right, how about the second um, cause of, of, of or the, the second greatest cancer in the U.S.? That's colorectal cancer. That's cancer of the colon and the rectum. That's the large bowel, okay? So, but look at this. Now, if this is something that you cannot prevent, 
if this is something that we just doom to have and nothing we can do can change it, why is it that there's such a disparity in the prevalence of colorectal cancer in these countries as compared to these countries? Look at Middle Africa, almost no cases of that, all right? And then now, so the scientists were trying to figure out why. I mean, there are so many different um, reasons or they, or they could postulate and everything of that sort. And some postulated, you know, something is a high fiber diet. And um, the hi as much as that's a very important point, a good plug, but even now, even in, in, in middle Africa and those places, their fiber intake has become so very low. It has become comparable to that of these countries up here. But yet there's a, a big disparity. Why? What they found out is this. It was the animal protein intake or the meat intake. And what they found is that the countries that had greater animal products intake had much higher levels of colorectal cancer. Down here in middle Africa, those places, meat was not the king of the plate. It was the bystander. It was on the side. It was somewhere on the back. So their meat intake was much less than that of societies like ours, right? Do we eat a lot of meat here? Yes, we do. Listen, you know, I, I, you're just thinking on it right now, right? So look at this. So this was the study about fat fiber and cancer risk in African Americans and rural Africa. They're saying that, okay, African Americans compared to uh, similar genes, rural Africa, why such a big difference in colorectal cancer? And look at what they found. So look, the higher rates are associated with higher animal protein and fat and lower fiber consumption. All right? So they found that even the biomarkers of cancer, it was much higher in the people who ate a lot of meat as compared to those who had a, a primarily plant-based diet. So what happens is this, right? When we think that our body digests everything, it does not. And when you put in a lot of animal protein, what happens is that there's a lot of animal protein that remains undigested in the gut. So just as smoking dumps a whole lot of toxins in our lungs, animal and undigested animal proteins, undigested animal products basically dump a lot of toxins into our large bowel. It messes with the normal flora, as in the normal things that's supposed to be inhabiting there. And it also puts that toxin load so high that it can, it can um, cause cancers. Look at this again. Relativance of protein fermentation to gut health. So what they found is that, look, meat intake does not only increase fermentation of proteins, but it also increases intake of fat, heme, and heterocyclic amines. Those things, they play a role in the development of colorectal cancer. All right? So there's a number of things associated with increased animal protein. In fact, what they've shown is that it increases your IGF-1 levels, and that causes cancers to multiply rapidly. So even the very, very small tumors that you may have in your body, by taking in a lot of animal protein, your IGF-1 level goes up, and the cancers rapidly multiply. Now, as our population is growing older, now you have a whole lot more years in which this cancer needs to manifest itself. So what happens? You have more cancers. Just that simple. What else does it do? It showed that animal protein, and listen to me, it ain't just, it ain't just the red meat. In fact, they showed chicken. Chicken was one of the highest ones, producing inflammatory changes in your blood vessels. What it does, it releases a bunch of inflammatory chemicals which go through your blood vessels, and they cause, it's almost like they cause little nicks and little abrasions on the inside of your blood vessels. Your body now sends those wonderful plaques to patch them up. So you have a bunch of band-aids on the inside of your blood vessels. As you continue eating a, a, a lot of um, animal fats and animal cholesterol, now the cholesterol produces almost little needles that sit on top of those plaques and cause those things to break off and rupture. What does that lead to? Heart attacks, strokes. You understand me? So basically, a stroke and a heart attack is almost the same thing. One happens in your heart, in your coronary vessels. The other one happens in your brain. So that's atherosclerosis, stroke, and all of those. Now, the, the, the heme iron, what they found that iron is good for you, yes, to build up your hemoglobin. But the problem is that that heme iron that comes from animals and the fact that we take in so much animal, animal products, it leads to that... Uh, 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 
a greater excess of heme ions, which releases a bunch of free radicals that causes cellular damage and leads to illnesses, cancers, heart disease, stroke, and all the others. All right? So let's move on. Oh, so this, I did that in a presentation. I, I pulled that from some information I got from since 2004. All right, and what they showed is that, okay, cancer, there's a number of risks. So certain things, look at those. Heterocyclic amines again, n nitroso compounds and those things. Where are those things found? Look at this. Heterocyclic amines, they come, they are carcinogenic chemicals found from the cooking of muscle meat, such as beef, pork, fowl, and fish. So any animal product, you start heating that muscle, what you do is that you liberate these chemicals. All right? And nitroso compounds, same thing. So you realize there's a lot, there's an incident of cancer with, with people where they, where they use a lot of smoked meats. All right? Uh, certain places in Asia, smoked meats. That's another issue too. All right? Polycyclic amines, same thing too. This is pretty new, 2015. Study now associates breast cancer with milk and dairy products. What they found is that cow's milk, even the organic cow's milk, they milk those cows, a number of them, they even milk them while they're pregnant. All right? And what they found is that just naturally occurring in cow's milk are a number of hormones that when we chronically put these things in our bodies, it leads to cancers, and especially with women and breast cancer, breast and ovarian cancers. All right? So, I, I'll tell you this, right? <coughs> Even the milk thing, you know, doing all the reading on milk and everything of that sort, I came up with a little common sense approach to it, right? And we realized that breast milk takes a, a five-pound baby or a six-pound baby, right? So my, baby, my babies were born a very little weight, right? So, six-pound baby, and it turns into a 12-pound baby in three months and turns into a 24-pound baby in a year. Cow's milk is supposed to take a 15-pound calf and turn him into a 500-pound cow in less than a year. So do you realize the number of growth factors and the amount of chemicals in there that are supposed to push for growth, push for growth? Now look at us in our adult state where we need just enough cells to, to repair, you understand, and to keep us going. And now we're consuming this thing which is highly, you know, it's like it's so highly reactive because it is, is ready to push, 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 and multiply cells and multiply cells. What are you doing? Aren't you increasing your risk for things like inflammation, cancers? Why is it that dairy is, such a, is so much associated with things like sinusitis? So your inflammation and stuff, a whole lot of mucus um, um, coming up on, your, on the sinuses and those, all right? Why is it that it's so associated with asthma? You understand? And there's, the, there's even the thought with respect to casein and the, the, the similarity between casein and the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas. So the body now comes to fight against the case and it ends up beating up the islets of Langerhans too. And it puts you at risk for developing diabetes. So there's an issue with dairy. And this is it's not making the dairy farmers any, any happier, but it's something that needs to be brought out there. So here's the next situation. Okay, so breast milk again. Oh, sorry, milk. It's cow's breast milk. Uh, there's a relationship between milk and dairy products with human illnesses such as, what, teenagers, acne, prostate, breast, and corpus, um, corpus luteum cancers, many other chronic diseases, all right? Even increased risk of early menarche, as in periods coming on earlier and earlier. You remember when we were younger, you know, girls would have that talk at, 30, uh, at 13, 14, 15. Nowadays, girls having to have that talk much earlier, right? Mm-hmm. And it's because of the things that we put in. All right? So look at this again. So this came out with WHO where they, where they had to just come out outright and say, listen, you know something? Processed meat, as in anything that doesn't resemble the original thing that it came from, processed meat should just not be eaten at all. Because the risk for cancer for processed meat is, is as big as smoking and all the, these other things. All right? So they showed you all, of the, in fact, I mean, they made recommendations. They say, hey, listen, you need to eat much smaller portions of meat. You should switch from to chicken or fish. You should keep some days red meat free. In fact, you should keep some days a week meat free. Uh, in fact, one of the studies showed with that IGF that I was talking about is that if you go meat free for about two or three days, it just in two or three days, it decreases your IGF levels back down to normal. Amazing, right? 
So a simple principle we could adopt. Just say, hey, you know something, let me go, I'm going to go meat free once or twice in the week. Even just adopting that principle, that practice is going to have major health improvements on your body. Simple as that. See what else? Oh, so, so that's back, back to this article, right? That was this big PDF document published by the WHO in 2004. So it's one of the biggest misunderstandings. They said chronic diseases can't be prevented. So many people, many people think that chronic illnesses cannot be prevented. Have we proven otherwise in, 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 in the, the information I've given you so far? Of course. So this is WHO's answer. They said, listen, look at this. They said, we know the risk factors. We know the major causes. And if these risk factors were eliminated, at least 80% of heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes would be prevented. And over 40% of cancers would be prevented. Now, that, those, those figures are even higher in many of the other studies that we've seen. Because look at this here. Say breast cancer risk was reduced by 60% in women all right, who went on a plant-based diet. You understand? And who adopted just simple as this. Lose the weight, eat foods of mainly of plant-based origin, and limit your alcohol. Just that. Decrease breast cancer risk in women by over 60%. I'll tell you this, right? This, this is the other principle I, I love to say, right? Um, and even in the write-up on the ad, you probably see, you, know, you saw something with respect to, you know, you don't have to completely cut off meat, and you, you know, you need to increase your fruits and veggie intake and everything of that sort and so on and so forth. The situation is this, I'll tell you. You, you reap what you sow. You get results of what, what you put in, all right? Which means if you make small changes, you're going to get small results. You make big changes, you're going to get big results. All right? Nobody's sleeping on me yet, right? We're soon done. Anyways, so, so this was a, they were talking about cancer incidents, and they compared, they compared actually Seventh-day Adventists and Baptists. That's in the Danish society. Why they did that? Because both Seventh-day Adventists and Baptists advocate against alcohol and cigarettes, right? So bo both groups, they're not smoking and they're not drinking, all right? However... In the Seventh-day Adventist group now, they, many of them adhere to a lacto-ovo vegetarian lifestyle. All right? And what they found is that much lower cancer rates in the Seventh-day Adventist population. All right? Men as well as women. All right? What they found is uh, incidence of lifestyle-related cancer, stomach, rectum, liver, cervix, and all of those decreased. All right? So what they've shown is that even putting aside the other risk factors like alcohol and smoking, once you make the changes in your diet, it is going to lead to decreased risk for those chronic illnesses. All right, this is another one, the Seventh-day Adventist Church Health Study. And it's a very large study, and that's the reason I quote it. Look, 34,142 participants, 29% vegetarians, 7 to 10% vegans. And what they found compared to the non-vegetarians, the vegetarians had half the high blood pressure and diabetes, half the colon cancer, two-thirds the rheumatoid arthritis and prostate cancer. Breast and lung cancers, they, they found that there were little um, decreases. However, the statistics were not enough for them to consider it, um, for them to consider it statistically significant. All right? So the point is that it's not just cancers. It's all of the chronic illnesses. Adopting a plant-based diet is going to decrease your risk of all of these chronic illnesses. They showed that the vegetarian life expectancy increased as compared to the people who consumed a lot of animal foods. All right, look at this. This was done in a, this is a British study. And what they showed again, compared to the non-vegetarian, Western vegetarians have a lower BMI. So that obesity thing is knocked off, all right? Next thing, a lower cholesterol, all right? Big thing, total cholesterol. And a lower mortality from heart disease. And they may also have lower risk for other diseases such as constipation, diverticular disease. That's another big thing. Right now, so many people in the Bahamas are constipated. <laughs> and what does that lead? It leads to little, little projections in the bowel wall. You know, almost like you're, when your tire develops a little egg, right? All right? And then those things get inflamed and they, ended up in, they end up in the hospital. We have to CT scan them. We find that they have diverticulitis. They leak a little bit. They drop um, stomach um, gut contents into the, into the abdomen itself. And they have to go on antibiotics, get admitted to the hospital, and everything of that sort. Diverticulitis is another big thing, right? Gallstones, appendicitis, 
and all, even appendicitis, wow. You understand me? So they showed, and look at this. So the evidence suggests that a widespread adoption of a vegetarian diet could prevent approximately 40,000 deaths from ischemic heart disease in Britain each year. These are some big numbers, right? You understand me? So, let's see. Diabetes. That was an old article again. That old article showed that 80% of diabetes was controlled on diet and exercise only. So they're saying that, listen, eat your fruits, all right? And, and that's another principle too. Eat your fruits, don't drink them. Eat your fruits, don't drink them. Why? Because if you squeeze out the juice of, a, of, of six apples and you get a can of apple juice and you down that, right? You get in the water, you get in some of the vitamin C, you get in a whole lot of the sugar, right? If you eat the apples, because first of all, you're not going to eat six apples. So already you decrease the amount of sugar you're taking in. What's also going to happen is that you're going to get the fiber, which is going to help nicely sweep that gut and get rid of all the toxins in there. It's going to keep your cholesterol low. Because of the fiber intake, it's going to slow the absorption of the sugar. And it's going to keep your glucose levels low. All right? It's also going to give you a number of other trace elements that did not end up in the juice. So that's another principle. Eat your fruits. Don't drink them. Anyways, sometimes it's a little bit inconvenient to get some fruit juice. Don't take too much. All right? So, and that's the reason why at the back there, I think they're giving you very small amounts of juice. <laughs> Anyways, so um, next thing here, look at this. This was, and I just like that table because it came from 2007 from GNC, from the, um, from the, the dietary approaches or the approaches to preventing hypertension. And they're talking about weight reduction, adopting a DASH diet eating plan, decreasing your sodium intake, physical activity, moderation of alcohol consumption. So you see, all this has to do with what we eat, what we drink, what we do. We're focusing on diet right now. So we're talking about, look at this, rich in fruits, vegetables, and low-fat dairy products. Now, it's interesting because even many of the articles that I've read, what they've found is that they do not want to tell people to go completely plant-based. Why? Because they say, you know something? That is like extreme. You know, and why should we be giving people stuff that is so extreme? People are going to feel bad. They're not going to want to cut meat completely. You understand? But the issue about this, I mean, honestly, what is extreme? I mean, if you have to open up your chest to actually fix three blood vessels that have been messed up with, with atherosclerosis and everything of that sort, versus eating hummus and, and, and mushroom burgers and those things, I take the mushroom burgers and hummus, right? And for me, I wouldn't think of that as extreme anymore. You understand where I'm coming from? But the issue is, it's the principle. So I'm not even here, I mean, honestly, this is, this is not even a situation about vegetarianism, veganism, and all, because many of those things, I mean, like veganism is almost, almost a religion in many parts. And many pe people do it for many reasons. Because there's also this thing about cruelty to animals. There's thing about the about um, um, preserving, you know, certain endangered species and the rest of those things and so on and so forth. There are many different principles attached to those things. But the issue is this: it's a whole food, plant-based diet. That's the principle here. Meaning, eating your foods with as little processing as possible. Whole food, plant-based. Meaning that. Your food should be, or the greater part of your food should be originating from plants. That's the principle that I want to get you to take home this evening, okay? And it, the issue is this. The smallest change you make, your body is going to start reacting. You're going to find yourself wanting to do more and more and more. You understand me? Many times I talk to people about, about changing the diets, and I tell them, I say, simple. I say, you know something? Take your plate that you have right now. Chop it in half. Half of it is whatever you're accustomed to eat. And you know in the Bahamas, we are accustomed to eat a whole lot of things, right? Yeah? So your peas and rice, and macaroni and cheese. And you understand me? I tell them, I say, listen, cut your plate in half. Half of it I want you to, be, to do fresh vegetables, either raw or lightly steamed. And the other half, whatever you're accustomed to eat. And man, listen to me, people, people feeling so much better. And what they find themselves doing is that they find themselves migrating towards eating more and more and more healthy stuff. And their practices just improve from there. So start anywhere you choose to start from, start. That's the whole deal. That is the take-home point there. 
Okay, so next. So you see we want to move away from the processed. Oh my word, I'm in trouble. We want to move to the more whole grains, okay? Whole grains. So plant-based diet. You know, now this originated from way back in Bible times, you know. You know, there, there are a couple of texts there of verses that, that refer to those things. Like that was Ezekiel um, getting wheat and barley, beans and millet, um, lentils, millet and spelt, using that to make bread. So he stone ground those things, and man, listen to me. That was a complete meal. You understand? Daniel, this was the, this was the, the first, it, it was quoted as the first case control study of, of dietary changes and the effects that it could have on you, right? Where in 10 days, Daniel and his friends were fairer and fatter than the people who actually chose to eat the king's meal, which was the so-called, quote-unquote, rich foods. You understand? The rich foods were highly processed, meat-based. You understand? Meat-based, likely probably alcohol, all of these things. You understand? Moving to a simpler diet, and these were the changes, right? So this is the pulse. This is the brain garden, which is a big thing on the Internet right now. And they're talking about people doing the Daniel Challenge and eating pulse. And talking about pulse, you're talking about the seeds, nuts, grains, legumes, and fruits. All right? High fiber, plant-based eating. And what they found was this, look. Weight loss without the hunger pangs. Food that lets us give up, give up processed foods, fills us up, nourishes us, let us shed hundred, hundreds of calories per day. All right? Diabetics found that their blood sugar levels stabilized. Underweight people were gaining weight, whereas overweight people were losing weight. Amazing, right? And so they found that just adopting that change in their diets, remarkable results. So, now here's what's going on. I mean, this is real. Unfortunately, the broccoli in 1930, which had 135 milligrams of calcium in there, in 1980 has just about 45 milligrams of calcium, and that was shown in studies. So there's a decline in nutritional content of our fruits and veggies, all right? So what's the issue with that? I mean, and, and the, the, the reason for this is agricultural methods. So you know, we rape the soil, really. So our planting practices, fertilizer use, um, leaching the soil, deforestation, all of those different things leads to even our plants having a decline in nutritional content. I will go f as far as to even say, too, our vegetables, by the time they get through the supermarket and get to our pallets, they've already been sitting there for two, three, four weeks and maybe more, and their nutritional content has decreased. Their water-soluble vitamins, vitamin C and those things, those have decreased by so much. You understand? They might be less than half, even less than that. All right? What that means? So the principle there again. One, it's good to, to start a little backyard farm. It's good to start a little compost heap. Because the things that you pull out from the farm and you eat them right away, Listen to me, they are filled with nutrition, way more than what you could get off the supermarket shelves. Buy local. Buy from our farmers. I'm sure you could go down to Cowpen Road and you will find our farmers there, and some of them do organic foods too. You understand me? So you go to them and you get your vegetables from them and you eat those within one day, two days, three days, even within a week. They still have way more nutrition than what it is that we get from the supermarkets. All right? So... The other thing is that some people do juicing and smoothies and stuff. Why? Because they realize that instead of now, I mean, you're not going to eat that amount of broccoli, but if you turn it into a juice, you'll find yourself eating a, a greater quantity than you, than you did if you were eating the, the real thing. All right? So just some principles in there. I'm not, making, I'm not giving you rules, but I'm giving you the principles. So next thing. So we do have supplementation, but you have to be even careful about supplementation. The reason why I say whole food plant-based diet is because, for example, the studies that were done on, on curcumin, which is the, the in, one of the main ingredients in turmeric, which is thought to have the anti-inflammatory properties and cancer-fighting properties and those, what they found is that if you did curcumin versus if you did turmeric, the, the um, inflammation-fighting properties and the cancer-fighting properties are way higher in the whole food or the extract which is just the whole food as opposed to what was extracted from it and just the, just the curcumin alone. Why? Because they found that there were tumorones, there were another um, curcuminoids, and there were, there were a couple of other chemicals in there that were lost when they made the, 
just, just the curcumin extract. So therefore, the principle goes back. Whole foods with as little processing as possible. The more whole you go, the better. Right? Good. Soon done. Anyways, so, but supplementation is, is in many cases, is necessary, yes, because of what I told you before about the, the loss of nutrients from many of our foods, as well as to, like, for example, people who are on a primarily plant-based diet, they may have little issues with B12. Now, the point of it is this, the cows and the apes and those things would get B12. Why? Because they pick up, you see, B12 is one of those things that comes from the, from, from, not from your body producing it, but it comes from these little microbes. Now, many of the things that we eat now are too clean. You understand? So our water is chlorinated, so it gets rid of all the microbes. Our food is highly cooked, so it gets rid of all the microbes. So whereas the ape and those things which eat off the ground, they have a little bit of dirt in there and everything of that sort, they are filled with those microbes and they get their full supply of vitamin B12, we have issues with it. In fact, many of the, some of the lifestyle centers will tell you when you get up in the morning and you take a big swallow, you're actually taking 0.5 milligrams or something of that sort of B12, just in the stuff that is sitting at the back of your throat. Sounds a bit dirty. But the issue about it is that <laughs> um, people who are eating a, a, very, a very intense plant-based diet may have to supplement some B12, okay? So what have we learned? We realized that this is from WHO. The leading contributors to premature death are diet and inactivity. Look at this. This is diet and inactivity. And tobacco and alcohol and the others take up this other half. You understand? What that means is that by changing your diet, and changing the other aspects of your lifestyle, and note that it is not just diet. I mean, we're focusing on diet this evening because if we were to focus on everything, I will have you here past 8, 9 o'clock, well, probably three, four days later, telling you about all the different things, right? Um, we use little acronyms such as NEWSTAD, nutrition, exercise, water, um, sunlight, temperance, air, rest, and trust in God. We use um, um, things such as celebrations where you talk about choice, um, and you talk about um, exercise and, you know, these different things. You, you, you talk about the different aspects of lifestyle. However, diet, which we're focusing on tonight, plays a very, very major role. So leading contributors to premature death, diet and activity. A little bit of, of, of the issues that's happening in the Bahamas. This was from the STEP study, and I compliment and congratulate the people who did that study because they pulled up a whole lot of, a whole lot of issues. I'll just focus on those that are diet-related. So you had all these participants, and they asked them a number of questions, and what they found is this. So look at this, right? Persons who are overweight and obese, look at this, man. 79 .6, 78.9, 80.4%. So we do have a real big problem in the Bahamas, all right? Next thing, fruit and vegetable consumption in a typical week, <laughs> all right? So mean number of days, let's go back. Mean number of days of fruit consumed. So the average person doesn't consume fruit for more than three days of the week, right? Mean servings of fruit. Now, you know that they said that the, the, the fruit and vegetable consumption should be, you, initially they said five servings of fruits and vegetables. Now they're saying actually seven to nine. The average Bahamian cons con consumes one serving of fruit per day. This is serious, right? We need to make some changes, right? Aha, uh -huh, we do. Vegetables consume an average day, about one serving too. People who ate less than five servings of fruits and vegetables on an average day, 90%. Wow. Which means nine out of ten people need to increase their fruit and vegetable intake. Hopefully it's not that nine. It's, we, we not, eh? we're, not in that, we're not in that nine out of ten people here, right? Because the fact that you're here, I realize that you want to do something, right? <laughs> okay, so remember our little food pyramid. Um, that was our original food pyramid. Um, and this is the situation now, right? Oh, and by the way, about that food pyramid, I just wanted to mention things like our fats and oils. Don't forget, they're at the top in very small quantities. We love this vitamin G. I mean, grease has to be in everything. Listen, we do not need that amount of oils and fats. And in fact, there's another issue too with superheating oils. Superheating oils causing a whole, lot of, a whole lot of toxins and those things come into our system. That's a problem, all right? So we need to practice using much less of those things. So you see, in the Bahamas, what we do is that we turn this food pyramid upside down and spin it like a top, right? 
<laughs> so, the deal is this. You need to increase your fruit and your vegetable intake. You see, they found all this. They, they almost found um, the foundation of this house. All right? So they're not supposed to be just sprinkled at the top. They need to be a, a much more prominent part of our diet. Now, this, the reason I put this right is because it is something that is not even just a personal thing. It is something that should be given a priority even in our nation with respect to, to what the laws that we institute, with respect to the policies that we put in place. So, I mean, the people who are listening to the, the sound of my voice or the people who are here who are people of influence, let me tell you something. This was from the Fiji Islands, right? The, 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 sorry, the, um, there's some Pacific Islands who realize that they have a shortage of fruit and vegetables in their own island. And the governments actually said, you know something? It is better that we highly subsidize and actually bring in those fruits and vegetables because it would be better. Look at this. See this? Look. So the costs involved in purchasing, shipping, and distributing surplus stocks of these goods for these islands would be considerably less than the costs involved in sustaining essentially sick populations. So we realize that even from an administrative point of view, if we recognize that this is what we need to do, we can do it for our country. You understand? And we will reap the benefits. It will be something that will bring much more financial benefits and much more value to our population later down the road. Sometimes many of the, much, much of the value that we cannot even quantify. I mean, you could imagine being healthier, being able to concentrate more at work, being able to accomplish your goals better. You understand? You can imagine less accidents, less admissions to hospital, less the reliance on a bunch of, um, uh, on, 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 on certain medications. You could imagine what that could do for the economies of our countries. Think about it. So, ladies and gentlemen, I urge you to adopt a whole food plant-based diet. It has been shown to do a number of things. I mean, listen to me. We cannot even finish talking about things like arthritis, things like diverticulite, things like Crohn's disease, and all these things where studies have shown that they have benefited, people have benefited or had clinical improvement in all of these things by adopting a plant-based diet. So I'll leave you with this picture, and I will open the floor now for questions, because I think I've, I've spoken for a very long time. I don't want you to fall asleep on me. All right? So we're going to stop here for now. Until the next time. Thank you very much.